to help you understand and guide you through what is a legal maze, my colleague Jane Boulter, who is a senior solicitor at the firm. Welcome, Jane. Thank you. If you've suffered an injury which was caused by your vaginal mesh, there are legal avenues that you may be able to pursue. The focus of most legal actions associated with vaginal mesh is to procure financial compensation for women. The litigation can't repair the damage that's been done by the surgery. All it can do is provide compensation for the injuries that you may have suffered. Those injuries will impact on your ability to work, your ability to care for your children, and we can claim compensation for that lost income for that um, inability to perform your domestic duties, and those and those um, that that's where that financial compensation comes into it. If the claim is successful, an award of damages and that is um, financial compensation will be made. There are different types of mesh, and as a result, different types of mesh litigation. A number of different types of mesh products were used on women and these, this has really added an extra layer of complexity to the process of pursuing compensation. The type of mesh which has been inserted will in many cases determine the type of litigation that will be pursued. So why was mesh used? So mesh was used to treat female pelvic floor conditions which included urinary incontinence, vaginal prolapse, nocturia, pelvic pain and faecal incontinence. And some surgeons considered that it was necessary to correct vaginal anatomy following a prolapse. And that view now is really outdated and most, most current, not all, um, current <coughs> urogynecologists only consider surgically treating a woman if the vaginal prolapse is symptomatic. So for example, a vaginal prolapse that's causing stress incontinence then they may just look at doing some kind of surgical option. If it isn't causing a problem and isn't causing a symptom, then there's no need to surgically repair it. Other treatment options, such as native <coughs> tissue uh, repair, uh, were historically overlooked in favour of mesh type repairs. Class actions. You will probably no doubt have heard about the class actions in the media, the Johnson & Johnson class action, which has raised a huge amount of awareness for these issues. And the mesh class actions have involved claims against the manufacturers of particular types of mesh, rather than particular doctors. And large multinational companies such as Johnson & Johnson can be expected to vigorously defend any claims made against their products because of the risk of a large number of potential complaints and potential compensation they'll have to um, um, hand out. So a class action is a legal mechanism that allows a group of plaintiffs to band together and to take on a large company. And without that um, legal process, it just wouldn't be possible for an individual um, plaintiff um, represented by um, you know, a, sort of a normal law firm to do that kind of legal action because the, the money, the disparity between the sort of large multinational company up here and the sort of small person down here, just, it just wouldn't be possible. The money that they would spend defending the case would mean that they would always win. So a class action, there are two type, there are two mesh related class actions currently in Australia. There's the American Medical Systems, the Ames class action, and there's the Johnson & Johnson Ethicon class action. This class action is currently before the court and in all likelihood it will run up until Christmas and um, we, uh, we're, we imagine that it, it's probably not going to settle and it will continue into the new year. Catherine Henry lawyers are not acting in the class actions. So if you have a mesh product which is the subject of the class action, we suggest that you get in contact with the lawyers acting in the class action. We can put you in touch with those lawyers if you get in contact with us. Cases where Catherine Henry lawyers can help you, and these are cases relating to TFS mesh, which I'm going to explain a little bit more about later and met a claim relating to a non-Johnson & Johnson mesh, but we note that some women have had a combination of mesh implants which can complicate um, proceedings. A claim against a particular doctor for the way that surgery was carried out. A claim against a particular doctor for failing to warn about the possible complications of mesh once these were known. 
and, discipli and a disciplinary complaint against a particular doctor involved in vaginal mesh surgery. So that's a sort of complaint um, by the HCCC about a particular doctor's professional conduct rather than a claim for compensation. So current cases, we act for a number of women who have had TFS, tape or mesh. We have garnered expert opinion from prominent leading urogynecologists who support our clients' claims in negligence and are highly critical of the treatment they've received. We're briefing leading barristers with significant mesh litigation and experience to provide expert um, advice and guidance. We are aware of a TFS case which has been listed for hearing in February 2018. And this, whether this actually runs the hearing, is, we don't know yet. It may settle, but we're watching this obviously with great interest. If it does settle, it'll provide very useful insights into the way the courts have, the, have their attitude to, towards TFS mesh and the associated medical negligence issues. One of our cases about TFS mesh is due to mediate before Christmas and we're hopeful of a good result and again that will give us a really good insight into the insurance company's attitude towards TFS and um, whether they're going to start um, paying out these claims. Can we follow that? Pardon? Can the public follow that? Well, it's a mediation, so the nature of a mediation process is that it's done completely confidentially. Everybody has to sign a confidential agreement, and we both put, we, we would put our arguments forward, they would put their arguments forward, and then we would, then we would move to discussing financial compensation. So we never completely know which of our arguments has swayed the other sides. It's 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 that's something that that's borne out in court later. So mediation is a sort of a pre-court process. And the, does the court have a jury? No, no. So it's a magistrate. No, it would be a judge. It would be a Supreme Court judge. So particular issues with TFS. TFS tape was not subject subjected to any long-term clinical studies in relation to whether it was safe or useful. TFS is a non-absorbable absorbable polypropylene mesh and it's very difficult, um, to almost impossible in some cases, to remove it once it's implanted. And many surgeons in Australia actually lack the skills to remove this mesh. Some, some clients have had to go overseas to get this, um, this product um, taken out of their bodies. There are associated serious side effects with, with, with this mesh and um, as, as these, and these have already been discussed, um, this, the, the mesh can erode into into the vaginal wall, it can um, it can cause chronic pain, it can the anchors can migrate into different parts of the body. It really is really awful an, an awful product. The TFS anchors are non-absorbable and they're invisible to medical imaging following implant, which sort of further complicates the process of removing of removing them. The types of injuries which are caused by mesh, um, well, these have already been discussed, but you can just sort of see there's the chronic pain, the infections, the bleeding, the psychological issues, the fecal incontinence. And as an, another note here, because these anchors from the TFS mesh can break off and migrate, but you can go anywhere in the body. So we don't actually know all the possible medical complications that can be caused by them and you're really dealing with an unknown quantity so it's very difficult to actually give a comprehensive list and most of most women's list of injuries are, although they bear some similarities, there are also quite dramatic differences as well. So damages is the way um, a claim for compensation, the way you would be awarded the, the, the financial compensation and it tends to be split into different what we call heads of damage. So we can claim damages for um, general damages, that's your pain and suffering. That's from a physical and a psychological perspective. You can claim um, damages for past and future loss of your earning capacity, so that's your inability to perform the job that you were doing before your surgery. And even if somebody wasn't working, if they were planning to return to work, we could claim that future loss of their capacity as well. We can claim for their past and future treatment expenses. So, for example, if somebody needs to go overseas to have this product removed, we can claim for, for um, the, cost, the cost of that and we incorporate that into their claim. 
uh, past and future domestic assistance, and that is what um, Lindy has, um, has focused on, and that is everything within, within the house, what you can and can't do if you're having to employ a cleaner, a gardener, a babysitter, all of these outsource, all of these jobs, that isn't, that isn't a, a cheap process, it's quite an expensive pro pro process, and if that goes on until the day someone dies, then obviously we're talking about quite a substantial amount of money. You also can claim for your legal costs and your disbursements. So the legal costs of bringing the proceedings um, are part of your a part of your damages, and so you can claim your legal costs if you are successful. Disbursements are the costs of the reports and the evidence that you will have to garner to prove your case. But all of, if you serve those reports, then you can claim those costs back at the end if you're successful. A related topic, which um, seems to be a, quite a problem with um, some of the claims that we've seen, and this is time limits. Now, time limits can cause problems in personal injury litigation, and generally proceedings must be commenced in the court within three years from the date the plaintiff became aware of the claim. Now, this isn't a hard and fast rule, it's actually quite a fluid um, proposition and which we, is interpreted on the facts of each individual case. But as a general rule, it's probably good to say three years from the date of injury, but that date is it's, it's very difficult to determine and you would need uh, legal advice about when, that's, when that date has expired. But the upshot of this, I think, is that if you have been affected, is to act promptly and to get in touch with um, a medical negligence lawyer to get some advice about whether you can claim compensation because it's not something you want to put off, particularly if the surgery happened a few years ago. It's something you need to really jump on and get some advice and act promptly. Now, I know there has been some interest in the Therapeutic Goods Administration, that's the TGA. So, the TFS take the mesh, was actually approved by the TGA and to, to, as, as a safe product. And this approval has now been withdrawn. The TGA's conduct is being examined by the Senate inquiry and they're looking into this issue. Then, it's possible that there will be future litigation against the TGA, <laughs> but at this stage, it's too early to say. So we're awaiting the outcome of the Senate inquiry and obviously watching it closely and we will be able to provide further information about that issue in the future.